totally fine. Um, but my name is Pavel Senkel. I'm the head of Schumacher College. I'm also the um, director of learning at Dartington Trust, um, a 1,200-acre estate and campus uh, in the southwest of England in Devon. Uh, and I'll ask Rachel, do you want to say hello? Hi, everybody. Lovely to see you at your various times of the day. We're in our lunchtime hour here. So we join you from England, from Devon, uh, and I'm program lead for the Masters in Movement, Mind and Ecology. Marie, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. So I am Marie Metenier with a very French accent, but in England, in Devon as well, like Pavel and Rachel. Uh, and I am associate lecturer on Movement, Mind and Ecology. And Third part of it. Excellent. Thank you both. Um, and I'm assuming uh, are kind of that the uh, uh, people in the waiting room, you're taking care of that. I don't have to worry. I will be taking care of it. Yes, okay. please. Great. It keeps popping up on my screen. So <laughs> no, um, I'll take care of it. Yeah, great. So, so we're going to talk for a little while. Um, I've got uh, some slides to share to sort of help ground our narrative. Um, and I think we're, we're dividing it up really into three parts to talk maybe about the interweaving narratives and in, sort of interwoven stories that help to shape both the program that we all teach on um, and have co-developed, uh, as well as sort of the, the, really the ground and the network in which it sits. Uh, and so my role as sort of head of college and director of learning in, in this session is really to give a broader context and overview um, of where the program exists and you know, a little bit of how it was developed. Uh, and then, you know, I'll turn it over to my colleagues for a more detailed discussion of, of some of the program specifics and some of the um, some of the sort of initiatives and uh, and learning outcomes and and projects and and uh, all the, all that all that fun detailed stuff um, and activities that we do on the, in the course of the program. Um, and certainly, I'm hoping that we've got some time left for questions at the end. Um, you know, it'd be great to have some some dialogue when we get through our presentation piece here. And certainly feel free to post questions in the chat. Um, I'm assuming that everybody's able to do that. Um, and then we can review them you know, when we get a chance. And you know, if there's something burning, feel free to just pop that question in there and we might even get to it during the talk. Uh, if that sounds all right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Great. And then minimize everyone else. So I can't really see anyone, but that's all right. Um, so yes, thanks for the introduction. Uh, the title of the session is sort of Embodied Ecology, Deep Encounters in Hybrid Places. And to talk about both the program, uh, Movement, Mind and Ecology that we've worked on together, uh, as well as for the context of Schumacher College, um, Dartington Trust, and also a bit of the Dartington, Dartington Art School, which also sits uh, on, on the campus with us. And it's really difficult for me always to think about where to start uh, these sorts of presentations or start descriptions um, and narratives because there's so many beginnings. Um, it's really difficult to pinpoint where. So I'm gonna start here. Uh, it, I'm sitting right now at the heart of the Dartington Estate um, in Southwest England in, the, in Devon, about 10 miles from the sea, about 10 miles from England's largest national park, Dartmoor, um, you know, which is absolutely a beautiful situation to be in. You know, the, the, the estate, has been home to, you know, as I say here, a century of experiments um, in learning at the intersection of arts, environmental practice, um, you know, progressive agriculture, such as it was in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, uh, and a variety of different experiments in making and artisan culture, um, really trying to build a, uh, a model for a just and sustainable society. Uh, beginning in, the in 1925, when Dorothy and Leonard Elmhurst first arrived here and looked at a medieval estate and saw some possibilities to take um, you know, some, uh, some learning experiences, whether they were grounded in the philosophies of John Dewey or grounded in the philosophies of Tagore. And so bringing those together you know, on an estate in Southwest England was really innovative and incredibly progressive at the time. Uh, and you know, it gives us you know, an opportunity to you know, continue that mission and vision uh, that we've been living for almost a hundred years now uh, to cultivate experiments in learning. And Schumacher College that I'm the head of is a 30 year experiment exactly like that. Um, I think it's a fantastic example of taking some of the mission and the vision you know, that the Elmhurst founded in 1925 and thinking about its evolution in terms of how we engage with you know, climate crisis, how we engage with increasing social, you know, social and ecological challenges globally and how we 
you know, try to tackle the intractable questions uh, in an embodied experience, experiential learning based, um, you know, uh, engagements, you know, that I think movement minded ecology, as we'll talk about, really tries to get at the heart of. Um, we run a whole range of postgraduate and undergraduate programs, um, short courses, really with an eye toward embodying what um, you know, the founder of Schumacher College, Satish Kumar, has described as a head, heart, and hands model of learning, uh, where you really integrate the embodied practice uh, with um, engaging in community work. You know, all of our students engage in you know, community work experiences and community learning across the site, uh, whether it's um, you're working in the gardens to help you know, harvest the vegetables that they'll then be preparing for you know, midday and evening meals to help clear up after those meals and to really participate in a learning culture and community that spills over uh, the boundaries of a traditional classroom. And you know, as we've all been living through and as we're engaged now in sort of a hybrid and online learning spaces, as we've been propelled that way because of the global pandemic, um, you know, that raises some interesting challenges and also opportunities for us to think about you know, how learning community and sort of the innovations and sort of progressive experimentation and learning you know, can manifest itself in those hybrid spaces. Um, how we actually create learning community, create experiential learning, create embodied practices um, in that context of sort of a global, almost a more distributed learning network than uh, can be found if everybody were gathered here you know, in Devon on the Dartington Estate. Um, you know, so we are both place-based uh, and distributed, you know, which is, again, a sort of interesting interwoven narratives to try to unpack a little bit during this session. Um, and again, community learning permeates all elements of that student experience. And as we've sort of lived through the last couple of years, I think probably many people on, in this session will have sort of been participants in an evolving paradigm um, of how we revision you know, delivery and engagement of educational practices across the spectrum. Uh, from you know children in schools through higher education through research, um, you know undergraduate, postgraduate, etc. And I wanted to talk a little bit about um, you know where that sort of hybrid engagement you know has taken us you know in uh, postgraduate programs across Dartington. And to give an example of some of the programs that we do run, we're currently running ten uh, postgraduate programs. So we're relatively small scale. We have about 120 students you know, across our developing undergraduate portfolio and our uh, postgraduate programs. And additional, you know, thousands of students come for unaccredited programming across the year. And increasingly, uh, we're engaging with those students in online and hybrid spaces as well. Um, some of the postgraduate programs we run, uh, Engaged Ecology is a um, you know, residential you know, postgraduate program that looks at ecological practice through the practice of making. Um, ecological design thinking, our regenerative economics are two programs that run in parallel, looking at design principles um, and looking at, you know, uh, sort of rethinking economic, uh, sort of the foundations of our economic thinking. Um, and then movement minded ecology, certainly, that we'll talk about more here. And we also running in parallel with, um, with Schumacher College, we have a, a newly sort of reconstituted Dartington Art School where we run courses such as Poetics of the Imagination, Arts and Ecology, Arts and Place, Reimagining Performance Practice. So you can see all of these programs really look at that intersection of arts, ecology, and social justice from an embodied practice, practical perspective, from an experiential immersive learning community uh, framework. And so as we're moving into you know, different ways to engage with students around the world, you know, we've looked at a couple of different models. And just to share this, it, it, hopefully it'll be useful for some, Think about an integrated hybrid online classroom you know, delivery, uh, which we have done a fair bit of with Movement Mind Ecology. I think Marie and, and Rachel may speak to some of that, you know, where we host synchronous Zoom lectures and workshops, as well as balancing that with asynchronous online discussions and other resources and experience sharing and pairing on and off site students to create sort of a third space learning community uh, where they engage with one another outside the classroom, you know, really requiring um, in our case, you know, not a tremendous amount of additional resource. And as we're building this out and may making more formal structures across starting across Schumacher and the art school, looking at running um, parallel sessions. So we have concurrent online uh, cohorts. They're supported in parallel sessions. We've done this in our, in our postgraduate program, Poetics of Imagination, for example, um, where we have synchronous lectures and separate sort of synchronous seminars, you know, really trying to think about what are the best ways to be able to create um, community among our online cohort, as well as foster community among our on-site students, and then how to best bring them together. 
Um, and you know, what's really exciting for us, I think we'll again talk about that a little bit in this session, is how we take the experiential embodied practice of learning community uh, and of you know, actual or, uh, uh, embodied practices within the program itself and help to support students who are not on site uh, whether it's you know helping to facilitate them with offsite um, you know facilitation and, and offsite spaces, um, or to do that in a hybrid or online setting. Uh, you know I'll put up this slide. Certainly, there's a tremendous amount to read on here, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that we do that. But this is an example, actually, from some documentation that we've been using. You know, thinking about how to generate a hybrid learning community across our learning provision, um, and thinking about you know, if we have these three columns of fully residential students, you know, how we you know, live and learn together and share community work in the kitchen gardens and, you know, creative community practices, um, how we do that in column B, uh, that students are fully remote, how do we engage them in similar practices by, you know, providing them with access, um, by bringing them in when it's appropriate, um, and also, again, sort of fostering you know, communities outside uh, you know, of Dartington that they can work together on. And then column C, you know, the hybrid, um, uh, hybrid format delivery, where we actually bring those, those um, two cohorts together. I think that's where, you know, I'll be quite honest, has been fairly challenging for a number of our programs um, to be able to sort of hold hybrid communities um, in place and, and in a coherent way and create that um, same sense or similar sense of learning community and embodied practice. Uh, with those two groups simultaneously. Um, but you know, certainly feel free. We can share these slides if you're interested or, or take a screenshot if you'd like um, and look at some of the details there. But really what we're talking about is you know, how to develop that you know, hybrid learning community um, where we're engaging with sort of the lecture and course material with on-campus and online students together simultaneously uh, and fostering and supporting that offsite experience for the students who are not with us. Um, so for Movement Mind Ecology this past year, we had students who were in many different time zones around the world, um, and that posed some challenges, as I think we might get into a discussion of. Um, but also, it created some really fantastic opportunities for students who were in places like uh, Nepal and New Zealand and South Africa, having experiences not just in different places, but different climates, different cultures, different time zones, um, different landscapes and topographies. And bringing those back to the discussion, to the community learning um, of our cohort and actually outside of our cohort as well with the larger learning community to be able to share those experiences and really enrich uh, the experience for all of our students. So for me, that was a really key takeaway. Um, and we have learned a number of different things you know, over the course here. And so I just wanted to maybe sum up my session, my section of this presentation here by just outlining some of what you know, we have learned or are still sort of evolving into the learning of, um, if that's the right way to say that. But, you know, thinking about using much more simplified tools. Um, you know, I think there was a lot of discussion very, very early on in 2020 when many of us were thrust into an online and hybrid, um, you know, uh, learning format of, you know, what sort of cool tools there are out there. But we found actually, um, you know, sort of what's been described as next generation digital learning environment or next generation digital learning tools, you know, can be really quite simple. Uh, the more complex it is, the more of a barrier there might be between the student and the experience. Um, we've had just fantastic uh, outdoor, um, you know, sort of physical active experiences, you know, just using mobile phones and mobile phones and signal. Um, and that has worked really, really well. Uh, document and share learning artifacts all throughout. Um, you know, there's such a tremendous rich archive of artifacts, you know, from this year's cohort from each course. Uh, that is easily accessible by students and staff, both for assessment purposes, but also just to create a picture of learning community and engagement that we've been having over the course that you can dip back into. Really limiting the synchronous Zoom time, uh, you know, we found you know, when we had to switch quite immediately in, the, in I think March and April of 2020, you know, there was a lot of movement directly to let's just put all of our lectures up on Zoom. Um, and you know, we knew that wasn't the right thing to do, but uh, it was you know, difficult to make that transition abruptly from a place-based embodied practical learning community to all of a sudden having students off campus the very next week. Um, but you know, certainly have learned to balance, um, you know, I think we work with roughly a you know, 15 to 20% synchronous to you know, 80 to 85% asynchronous um, balance of, uh, of online and hybrid learning and really empower those hybrid community spaces as I had in the previous slide. Um, you know, develop hybrid native assignments. 
So, you know, assignments which actually are conducive to being worked in in that space. So students who are online and students who are on site can work together in, in a little in groups um, and co-create offsite experiences with the students, uh, whether it's a field trip that we're having uh, here in Devon with a smaller cohort, you know, to help to um, support students doing a similar field trip, you know, which again, they can bring that experience and really enrich the, um, the conversation that we had about our on-site experiences later on. Um, and really design hybrid specific learning spaces. You know, again, using simplified, relatively simple tools, I think it's quite easy and we'll see some examples of that to create uh, spaces that are really wonderful for both on-site and off-site students. And what has been quite key to us also is embedding a digital wellness program, which we have for our staff as well as for our students. And we're continuing to evolve that program, but just thinking about how we engage with one another and with these um, with these digital spaces in ways that are mindful of our individual and community wellness. And then just recognizing, as I've said, uh, uh, started to suggest here that the hybrid and blended learning can really enrich experience for all students. Um, sometimes it's seen as an impediment uh, and it can be in, certain, in some instances, if you're trying to do a particular site-based activity, uh, it can pose some challenges and barriers, but also I think opportunities to again, diversify the experience uh, and bring in different narratives and different stories to, to um, tell a more complete or give a more complete shape to a global experience of place and global experience of embodied practice. Uh, and then it, we're really beginning experiments with um, distributed global learning networks uh, in a number of different projects that really bring together uh, specific sites around the world uh, and you know, that are able to foster and support student experience, learner experience in different places and then really, even with an eye toward specifically sort of decolonizing curriculum by engaging with partners across the world, you know, the, the Europe, North America, and the global South, um, and to be able to learn from one another and co-create the curriculum across this network. So that's kind of the next um, iteration of the lessons that we're learning from the hybrid experience. And you know, we can look for a future presentation, hopefully, about that. So I think I'm going to switch it over to, I think this is Marie, is it not? Yeah, indeed. So, yes, so I hope everyone can hear me. Brilliant. Yes. Thank you. So for the second part of uh, this conference, I'm going to take you um, across movement mind and ecology and bring some example of how we uh, encounter in hybrid places across our five uh, different modules. So as you can see on the left um, left side of uh, yeah left side of the of the slides where you've got movement in mind ecology and embodiment mediated boundary and performing place those are the titles of the four first four modules that we are teaching on the program. So I'm just going to tell you um, ref, well summarizing what the modules are to give you a bit of context and then I will tell you and take you to explore some of the workshop. So module one, movement and mind, if we work from the bottom to the top, Mod movement and mind is very much about um, shared movement practice, which explores um, ecological encounters within both human to human, but also human to non-human relationships. And you will see that this is very much a thread about um, of movement, mind and ecology. So the second module, which you can see again on the, on the left uh, of the slide in the picture, is about ecology and embodiment. So here through disciplines such as movement ecology or more than human geography, our students really explore the role of movement across different environmental scales. So here we look from the microscopic um, to the climatic scale and we uh, interweave um, on those different scales. So uh, they use for this module different uh, methods such as embodied practice, uh, and that's a way to explore interspecies storytelling and to bridge boundaries between the self, the community, and the modern human world. And speaking about boundaries, our third module is actually entitled Mediated Boundaries, in which uh, our students uh, really focus on challenging boundaries in the context of humans and modern human experiences. So here we look at the con at gendered concept of place decolonial perception and construction of place-based experience. And finally, performing place, 
which is module four, is very much about uh, for our students to work independently, but also in partnership to develop a movement-based practice that helps to connect um, the more than human world, but also the communities. So as you can see, we explore in movement mind and ecology a broad spectrum of more than human form of existence and their interconnection with and within humans' embodiments. So what is at the heart of our uh, hybrid teaching is very much that triangulation between field studies, group discussion, and theories. So with theory, we try to connect uh, voices across um, very uh, different disciplines. So uh, our program is very transdisciplinary. So we select a different type of text as contribution to longstanding debates. And uh, we build our student knowledge through um, that interweaving with theory, group discussion, and field studies, as you can see uh, on, the, on the different pictures, so how we move to different places. Padel, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So here I'm going to uh, present some of our student work to demonstrate how we work across hybrid places. So in this lecture seminar, the purpose was to have a conversation with water across places. So um, as Pavel said, we are very lucky to work on the Dartington estate. So our on-site students have access to the river Dart, which find its origin on the uh, Dartmoor National Park. So the idea of this workshop was first of all, to give the students some theoretical background. So you can see on the right part of the slide, we gave the students um, an article um, so they can reflect on nature as a legal person. And especially we looked at two case studies uh, in New Zealand where a river has been given um, legal rights, so legal personality, and what were the implications. So we started the workshop with a, a group discussion on the outcome of giving nature rights. And then we, um, the students on site and online, as you can see on the left side of the, of the slide, build together a survey to explore uh, humans relationship with water. So for our students on site, uh, they were going to take the survey, which they built with on online students as well, to the river dot to ask questions and uh, to use a gap signal. So as you can see in the middle of the slides, uh, this is uh, their interview that they recorded. Um, and obviously our students online uh, were going to access water uh, wherever they were in the world. So our students in Nepal went uh, to uh, a river near his home and our student in South Africa couldn't really access the ocean on that day. So she just took the survey to her family. So then after that, so it was very much that field work for, um, I think it was roughly like three hours where the students were asking questions uh, and going on the field. Then we gathered back into uh, the classroom, so the, the, in the SHIP studio, and the students online and on-site share their experiences. And uh, obviously we raised questions regarding ethics, what we were going to do with the results of the data according to the GDPR. Uh, and they discussed also about how um, humans perceived the rivers, the ocean, the coastline. And they drew from um, one of the reference in the article which is the river is me, I'm a, I am the river. A very beautiful question, which triggered um, debates around the notion of ecocide, which is crime against the environment, and riverside, which you can see again on the middle of the slide at the bottom. Um, so that idea of uh, the pollution of the environment and what are the crimes against the environment. And what was really interesting during this workshop is that one of our online students join us a bit later during the day because he couldn't uh, make it. And actually he was very much in, embedded into the workshop because the students asked him the question that they uh, developed during the group. So it was adding another layer of hybrid teaching where um, yeah, all those questions were interweaving uh, with each other. Could you please um, go to the next slide? Thank you. So as I was saying in the, in the slide where I introduced the module, one of the common threads of our movement man in ecology is very much looking at the role and the place of the modern humans and the non-humans. 
So a common thread is very much more than human features and animals' empathy. So we really want to focus on this during movement finding ecology because more than humans proposes complex entanglements, uh, frictions, and reparative attention across species and beings. So we are really thinking past the centrality of the human subject. And we look at theoretical um, themes such as effective ecology, where the students explore empathy, emotion, environmental narrative, but also, as you can see on the right part of the slide, um, because the model experience of humanities. So here on the right slide, on the right part of the slide, you've got um, one of the formative assignments that um, a, a student did, and she did a wonderful job by looking at a, an oak mother and a human mother, and she created a conversation with the two, looking at um, those affected ecologies. And on the left uh, part of the slide, you can see um, a workshop which we did uh, with um, online and on-site students on animals' empathy. So for on-site students, um, we were lucky to have goats on the Dartington Estates. So students were asked to look at goats' empathy and goats' interaction, and then go and, and observe the behavior of the goats. And obviously, our online students uh, choose uh, choose sorry a different animal that they were able to access during uh, the field lecture and then again we gathered back together uh, and we discussed the findings regarding the theory and the field experience can you go to the next slide please thank you so on this slide uh, this is another example of how we look at entanglements between humans and non-humans and linking here more into our module three, mediating boundaries. Um, decolonizing practices and knowledge is very much at the heart of our practice. So as you can see here, we try to connect globally students from different backgrounds, and we ask them to challenge boundaries between humans and humans, but also between humans and more than humans. So here is an example of what the question, of the question that um, one of our students asked, uh, regarding how she's perceived um, as living in South Africa, coming from a, an ethnic minority background. And also, uh, she asked questions to um, periwinkles and how um, the periwinkles were living regarding to animals' empathy. So in this way, we are really me mediating within these boundaries. And it also helps us to, um, and a lot of students to reflect on climate injustice and inequalities, um, as well as um, Anthropocene and indigenous practices. So we really look at mapping practices to challenge environmental injustices. And this is just an example of how our students express it um, on a Padlet. I think it was Padlet for this example. So if you could go to the last slide of my section, please. So finally, we also connect our students across scales. And the last workshop I am presenting here really reflect transdisciplinary embodied practices in an hybrid context. So to give you a bit of background here, uh, we gave to the students um, extracts from the Global Climate Tragedy Committee written by Bruno Latour, uh, Frédéric Aitwati, and Chloé Latour. So it's basically a lot of different sequencing where they would uh, be able to reflect on the place of Gaia. So here, the theoretical background uh, hmm, is very much, sorry, I'm looking for my word, is very much from uh, James Lovelock to Bruno Latour. And it's very much this idea about working across scales for the students. So our on-site students and online students had some of that uh, theater sequencing that they could uh, perform during um, the afternoon of the workshop. So on-site students um, worked outside and in the studio to perform um, those sequencing of the theater. And our online students were um, in a Zoom, um, Zoom room where they can also, also perform. And the students presented it to each other and reflected on what they understood from uh, the text which allowed them to um, really think about um, existing anthropocentric boundaries, 
but also thinking about the concept of critical zones and entering critical zones. So here, drawing on more recent work by Bruno Latour, um, so critical zone, I'm just going to uh, reflect on that. It's a living, breathing, and constantine, constantly, sorry, evolving boundary layer where living organisms, rock, soil, and water interact together. So the idea was very much in that workshop to look at the complex interaction which regulate the natural habitats and look at different scales as well. So as you can see, we are bringing a lot of different theoretical backgrounds and scholarship as well. Um, and this workshop um, provides really a holistic and transformative educational framework to connect resilient learning communities, because this is really the aim also of what we are doing. It's that connection of global students and giving them um, yeah, resilience with learning and field practices. And that's it for me. So I'm going to pass it on to Rachel. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Pavel. Um, I hope you're all still here and listening. Um, I'm going to give a kind of subtitle to this last section, and the subtitle is called Breathing Through the Screen. And actually, I'd like to invite everyone here with us uh, today to or this evening to go ahead and maybe close your eyes and just take a moment to rest them from the screen. Um, you may want to shift your weight a little bit. You just need to be able to listen rather than look for the next five minutes. So become aware a little bit of your own bodily presence in receiving this information. And I'd like to talk a little bit, we've had some lovely illustrations of the kinds of things that we do. And I want to talk just for the last section of kind of how we experience this, particularly in this environment, particularly through the sort of screen based learning. And as Pavel has spoken about, we, we have students who choose to take all of their student, uh, all of their studies remotely. So the connection is through the digital. And then we have the students who are sometimes with us in low residency kind of formats and then go away. So we have this kind of migrating bodies. We shift from screen to fleshy kind of pedagogies. I wanted to talk about the beginning of this kind of era, almost the land before Zoom. I remember my own teaching experiences uh, over two years ago where almost overnight we had to shift from studio to screen. It was a new geography where we shifted out of our immediate and habitual empathetic landscape of mixed endorphins, collective energies, call and response reflexes, expansions, contractions, departures, encounters, all of which made up the explicit and subtle communications in an average practical day's teaching, replaced instead by replicated, packaged, and widely distributed screen bodies that somehow disguised the cost of human empathy with other fleshy bodies, or as one colleague stated, we're all slightly in danger of ceasing to exist from the waist down. We entered a new territory where together with our students, we needed new levels of co-responsiveness and shared responsibility in order to kind of co-pilot this exchange. We entered these new geographies where language around spatial movement became increasingly entwined with political rhetoric in these expanding and shrinking territories. We all seemed to become a kind of proxemic polemic. Freedom, of, freedom or restriction of movement, protection of borders, expanded peripheries, invisible contagion, private spilling into public, boundless digital versus contained physical space. This new pedagogy brought with it a new psychological barrier also, where I realized that often by Friday, my eyes had a kind of twitch and I found I had st screen streaks whenever I closed them and a slightly dull headache. Unlike closing the office door on a Friday, how can we control and monitor our screen usage in this new expanded digital learning practice? And feel, feel free to shift. I will let you know when I change the, um, the detail on the screen. So just feel free shifting around in your space. 
Um, a part of our program that we've talked about today, the MA in Movement, Mind and Ecology, is seeking to surface pre-reflective bodily self-consciousness as a means towards expanding connections within a larger world, a kind of always becoming phenomenological fact. In this, we emphasize both the thickness of corporeal presence and the experience and the co-becoming of self within the context of social and ecological domains. The philosophical premise and pedagogic aim around the kind of somatic approach that we lead in this course is to debate and unpack the ecological, political and philosophical experience and significance of corporeal activity. So somatics has been written about a lot, and I just thought I'd touch very briefly on uh, Maxine Sheets Johnson, who back in the 1970s um, described dance, and I'm using dance as a broad metaphor really of movement. And she described how movement is not necessarily moving through a form, but rather in dancing, a form is moving through us. To be an object in motion is to fulfill a kinetic destiny. And to fulfill a kinetic destiny is to bring a qualitative world to life. The dancer, Sheets Johnson suggests, is not making a quality manifest, but rather the quality of movement is manifesting itself. In her book, Vibrant Matter, Jane Bennett argues for a particular aspect of material agency in a kinetic assemblage of material worlds in which human perception and conceptualization might participate, but do not and cannot fully describe the objects. She suggests that there is a kind of thing power that gestures towards the strange ability of ordinary man-made items to exceed their status as objects and to manifest traces of independentness or aliveness constituting the outside of our own experience. And in this, I'm reminded of some of these kind of site responsive strategies and place kind of responsive pedagogies that Marie talks about when we discuss the river. So these physical entanglements with the more than human world is for us a way of activating a kind of movement based thinking in order to engage in affective ecologies. In this, our attention to visuality, aurality, tactility, and also kinesthetic empathy as modes of attentiveness in examining and engaging with worlds that might not so much speak to us, but rather rhythmically communicate through these singular or indeed fused senses. And if we can just open up to the next slide and I invite people to sort of softly, maybe open your eyes and not necessarily look at the screen, but perhaps look around the screen, look at the textures of the computer, Maybe notice the dirt spots in between the keys. Maybe notice which part of the keys seem more worn than others. So thinking about Jane Bennett as a way of kind of bringing attention to this material world, what might be the material agency of the computer screen, of this, these keys that have become worn and smoothed with the touch of our digits? Both Deleuze and Spinoza talk about notions of affectivity and indeterminacy as ways to allow us to consider how objects might also be regarded as performing their own presence. And for me, this is one of the strategies that we think of in terms of working with the more than human world. Um, we, I'd like to just credit very quickly one of the artists that we worked with on this course called Erin Kavanagh. And Erin describes herself as a kind of creative archaeologist. And what Erin talks about, um, or sort of introduced our students to, and many of these students have kind of picked up with this as a way to engage in uh, landscape from a quite a kind of holistic perspective, and it's deep mapping. So the concept of deep mapping as an aesthetic and methodological and ideological tool enables an approach to place that democratizes knowledge by crossing temporal, spatial and disciplinary boundaries. And I think this is what we're talking about when we talk about decolonizing place. Um, 
What I'd like to share is in a moment, some of the contextual journals that have kind of written themselves out. Um, and students have been really interestingly kind of trying to track and disseminate and reflect on their practices and to sort of describe some of the case studies that we've shared with you today, but trying to find really um, kind of open access ways to do this. So maybe if we just shift on to the next um, slide there. And actually the next two slides we'll just kind of talk to briefly and then I'll, I'll kind of round up. So these are some of the ways that students manage to engage in this very kind of ubiquitous way of using technology. So as Pavel mentioned at the beginning, it's sometimes the most simple tools that actually allow us the freedom and that kind of don't invade and don't kind of interrupt the space of the screen. So this is an example of a field study. We were looking at the notion of contested landscapes. Um, the sort of the brief was the PDF that was provided at the beginning. And this really translated across the different bioregions. So we had um, a student that was working in, um, in Cape Town in South Africa, a student from Nepal, a student from New Zealand, um, the students that were with us on site, we went to this um, space, which is um, about 10 miles from, from the campus. And we looked at what was a drowned village. So it was actually um, a correlation with a, a sort of, um, there had been some dredging where they had pulled sand up to make concrete. This is pre kind of World War II. So this is going into the sort of British Navy and the formation of the Navy. And then from that point, about um, three years later, there was a storm that basically destroyed the livelihood of this small fishing village. Um, but we took these themes of kind of experimental heritage and contested landscapes, and that really opened up into a much broader conversation about how that term contested landscapes was really operative in relation to these different um, different bioregions. So coming back to the screen, and I'll just touch on one more thing, I've become very conscious with our shift in the design of our project or uh, in the design of our course, we move between uh, immersive by intensive um, sort of residential uh, practice and, and learning. And then the students do sort of move out. And as I said, students that are taking the whole course remotely, um, there's that sort of slight shift of register for those who have chosen to kind of come and study with us. And we all become a digital community. So a real question around that is how do we promote and continue to sustain and maintain our practice? working from these kind of separate regions. But also how do we start to become really comfortable with this, with this kind of Zoom comments that we find ourselves having to kind of come in and out of on a regular basis. Um, one thing I've noticed in our cohort is how the people um, within the group have become really kind of naturally started to adjust their own frequency levels, almost like moving the furniture around the Zoom commons. Um, and I've also sensed this um, growing kind of visual acuity in how students are kind of collectively framing, positioning and kind of receiving information and receiving their screen bodies. So two tools that I would suggest have come from this are peer empathy and self-compassion in learning. And certainly these seem to be kind of tools in this emerging social fabric of education. I start to trust for myself that when students close their cameras or mute, it is simply to make space for listening or for viewing each other. And if we could have the next slide then, this should be an example of one of the contextual journals. So this is, um, maybe I'll just let people kind of allow some of the language to sort of jump out from, from these different images here. So these are simply examples of how students have found their own creative expression using open access digital platforms for research. These are available to each other and they have common boxes. So without going into the detail here, this has also allowed for a kind of constant curation of the students evolving practice. And they've become quite interesting to see as almost their own sort of evolving digital signature. So again, this sense of visual acuity and this notion of how do we frame the body in empathetic relationship to landscape? And also how do we give priority to the relationships between the human and more than human world? So in all of this work and in this evolving kind of quite visual feed and evolving pedagogy, for me, there's an inbuilt invitation to really readdress subjectivity in its manifold forms. 
In this, we look to a couple of broad philosophical areas, certainly uh, Rosie Bredotti and her um, proposal of the nomadic body, Deleuze and Spinoza and their address of affectivity and indeterminacy, as well as, of course, Jane Bennett's questions of non-human agency within tangible and physical material worlds. We're still finding our feet in this world and we're still aware of many challenges, some of the logistical challenges of creating bulk content. So what are the questions of kind of digital waste that we do have to kind of incur when we're trying to kind of locate and archive all of these processes as we kind of walk through and develop among our community. And if you go to the last slide and what I'd actually like to do is just put up a couple of um, questions on the chat line and maybe these are sort of questions that we can lead into as we start to open up to a conversation with everybody that is here. They're really not, not so much answers as questions. Moving towards 21st century progressive education, how can we allow for a place of agency and autonomy to coexist in a shared digital teaching and learning practice? What kinds of bodies or body attentivenesses are we kind of focusing on and how can we make these mutual and reciprocal rather than staff led or hierarchical? What are the kinds of resistance strategies that we might promote in order to move away from what I would suggest as a kind of cult of individualism that tends to kind of fold into digital landscape? And then most importantly, how do we build trust both between us as lecturers and also trust within our student peer group particularly those who don't get to physically kind of shake hands in the space. So how, this, is, this is really a key ingredient of promoting any kind of healthy cohort and making sure that sort of trust is, is an absolute core value within the group. And then last but not least, and I think we've touched on that today, how we best communicate stories from our diverse bioregions, timelines and temperatures, and how are these stories received and disseminated more widely. And I think I'll finish there. I'm just aware we're probably up to what we should be. Uh, we've left probably 10 minutes for, for questions. So I'd like to suggest if we can come back into the room, if anyone does have questions, you're very welcome to turn on cameras. I think we have about 10 minutes left for that. We had one question from Michelle. Uh, I would invite Michelle if she would like to turn her camera on and speak. Hi, uh, thanks for that wonderful enriching uh, presentation. Uh, so I'm Michelle and it was wonderful. I'm from Cape Town, South Africa. So it was wonderful to hear that you had a, a student from South Africa. So, so I teach at a university, political ecology, but I myself, uh, use a lot of uh, the theory about the more than human worlds and so um and bringing that into sociology which is very humanist <laughs> so um yeah so my question is and i am in this the space academically of science and technology studies and many of the scholars that you propose but you know one of the challenges is how does this work and understanding and shifting the understanding of the world become a bit more interventionist in a sense that there may be some sort of knock-on effect. Um, so I was just wondering your thoughts and and where do the students go and then where, where do they work? And so you know so the, the challenge is that you know sure it you know we can expose the injustices but it doesn't really automatically shift into something different and particularly our shifting social relations and political relations that's created out of modernity. So yeah, big question, but yeah, I just thought maybe you have some yeah, ideas. Can I, can I start the answer to that and then turn it over maybe to Rachel and Marie? Um, just thinking broadly at Darnika Schumacher, um, one of the initiatives that we've really been working in earnest you know, from pre-pandemic really is to develop much more robust partnership working um, and recognizing that you know we can't ultimately deliver the learning ourselves, um, you know that the students, particularly in this global context, uh, want to engage with in a meaningful way, and to really authentically provide them the pathways and the tools so that they can you know multiply the the effect of the learning that they're doing in our community, and effectively by the end of each program, ask them to 
you know, turn outwards um, and to face, you know, community, um, you know, uh, community engagement opportunities, you know, work with public, uh, you know, various, uh, various publics to try to engage them in the similar conversations. And in fact, to help nudge, con you know, whether it's dialogue or action or practice, um, in the direction and the trajectory that they've been on in the course. And so I think each program is already embedded with that type of, you know, let's propose an intervention um, and, you know, give you the tools and the, the connections and the network to be able to embody that in practice once you leave. But, you know, perhaps it's worth talking a little bit about MME. I could just quickly speak to that. And I think if you remember the um, what Marie outlined in terms of the kind of um, the, the four modules and certainly the chronology as we move into the fourth module performing place is to sort of shift the responsibility back into the notion of student as community community facing projects, but also notions of embodied leadership, kind of co-creation, facilitation. So really taking those kind of key key tools that they've developed through modules one to three and starting to turn those out. Um, I'm just thinking of other instances through the course. Um, so COP26, obviously, kind of that coincided at the end of October and students were very much um, had leading roles in participating. Um, one thing I do find with in terms of the sort of digital portfolios that we, we touched on, um, one thing I really enjoy about those is they tend to break down some of those barriers in terms of accessibility. So we've had students, let's say, for example, that are really interested in a particular met methodological approach or a particular author, and they've gone ahead and invited them to come into those portfolios and to comment on those. So there's a really nice sense of sort of transparency in the work that they're creating as part of a kind of ongoing archive of their own practice. But it sort of opens up so for me the kind of bridge the bridges are very much geared in how the students document and disseminate the the practices they're exposed to right from the beginning and I also would say that that seems to be strengthened by the fact that our course does both that we have the kind of you know constant international um, community that we're having to share and disseminate research with and in that sense technology has been a real friend I think. Marie, I don't know if you have anything to comment. Yeah, well, I think you've said most of what I wanted to say already. So I'm just going to um, emphasize the fact that we really are trying to um, build resilience in our students. I think, Rachel, you mentioned the fact of trust. But yeah, complementing that, that is very that resilience. So we give them the keys to develop um, their knowledge, and then they take it into their sphere. And as you were saying, there is that graduation through um, to the course where our students are on a journey as well, and a resilient journey. So we can see their evolution and how they take it outside of the of the course, come back and discuss. And so, yeah, I think it's beautiful evolutions on that. So thank you, Michelle, for your question. I hope we've, we've answered it. So we have Ivy uh, with the next question. And after Ivy, Claire. Um, Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, I, I was studying at Schumacher from 2016 uh, to 17, and I'm aware that, you know, the college has been um, going through uh, transformation, you know, due to lots of uh, reasons. And I'm really happy to hear that the college is very, you know, adaptable to the current uh, challenges and embracing, you know, tech uh, technology, uh, the digital the digital space and developing you know this new hybrid model and I feel it's so cool that you know it's and also it's so um, Schumacher that we see screen and zoom and digital and technology as animate organism and how we embrace that into learning space so I'm super super excited to hear all this um, and I'm also particularly interested in uh, what Rachel uh, mentioned about, you know, uh, being aware of the digital waste or, you know, this huge amount of data we create with a hybrid model. Um, and, you know, I've been thinking about, is there any like the circular model being um, applied, um, you know, in the, in, in the digital sort of you know production and consumption um realm so i was wondering um what kind of you know thoughts or actions uh, that you guys uh, are having to 
address or to take care of the digital, you know, either we say waste or it just, you know, how we can apply the 5R model, right, to the digital assets and the production and consumption. Very curious. Thank you. I can touch briefly, but I'd really like to kind of send this one back to Pavel. <laughs> um, but maybe I can just touch briefly in terms of also, you know, it is the digital, it is the waste, but it's also just those physiological processes of, of absorbing information. So it's all very well to, to, to kind of record and, and have a record of a two, year, a two hour seminar, but it's not the same. So we've got to be really careful about these levels of synchronous and asynchronous kind of uh, materials, but very simple strategies that we've discovered with our students things like podcasts work better for somatic kind of you know sense based information so we will do something called syncing in as an activity that happens at the beginning of every week um, and each student will propose a space a walk something that you plug in with your headphones and you have these kind of encounters with place and then of course the signal that um, Pavel mentioned so we will have a signal chat that we kind of report back so we have those very instant sort of visual as well as kind of sound based responses to place. Um, in terms of the wider ecology of um, the actual kind of byproduct of this teaching, um, I think what we try and do certainly is have different access routes. So we have students also in countries that their Wi-Fi is actually really weak or that there's only certain times of the day that they can access the Wi-Fi. So we've got to remain sensitive to those different kind of access issues as well. But in terms of the wider question of digital content, this is an ongoing debate, I think, just that needs to really kind of come into the fore in higher education. I don't know, Pavel, if you have any more specific thoughts. Just, from just really briefly, mindful of time as well. Um, you know, I think for me, the digital waste was an interesting way to phrase it, Rachel, that I've actually, I've not phrased it that way before, but thinking about not just the sort of mental and emotional sort of baggage and, and, and sort of the, um, the toll that it takes on us to engage in this way sometimes, um, as well as sort of the, the literal bits that are that are out there in the archive, but also the carbon footprint of the energy that's required to to run all of these, um, you know, massive computers that that enable us to do these things. And you're thinking about it from a Schumacher perspective. You know, it it is about ecological systems and complexity, uh, and so we can't just think of this as being someplace else or this as being a window to another place without thinking about the connectivity and the ecosystem that connects the two. Um, and so for me, it is about sort of engaging with that and not displacing uh, the footprint that's created by this engagement, but actually engaging in it and really thinking proactively. And I think we are right at the beginning of those conversations um, of how to actually in, engage that in the learning that we're doing in an active way. Thanks for the question. So we are at the, the end of our session, but we can go five minutes over. We have Claire with one more question. Is that okay with you all? Claire? Um, hi, sorry. Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, sorry, this might be a bit of a big question, but I'm just interested in your first thoughts. Um, some of these spaces is the climate movement, access to nature and access to higher education education um, is very kind of white middle class dominated and very difficult for other other groups to to participate in for, for a multitude of reasons so I was just wondering how Schumacher College and all this particular module um, aims to kind of tackle that or, or what it yeah what are the thoughts around that I can give that a start. Um, you know, it, it is it is a big question, and I'd love to have a much longer conversation, uh, you know, about that. And in fact, we have quite a few conversations, and you know, try to enact some some changes to try to engage, you know, different publics, uh, different stakeholders and audiences, you know, in our um, uh, in our sort of learning portfolio, in, in our opportunities to learn, you know, in the context of the Schumacher College and Dartington networks. Um, and you know, part of what we're doing in terms of we're, we're increasing accessibility through a variety of means, um, whether it's actually reframing the programs uh, in a way that can be engaged in a hybrid format. Um, we've seen a massive shift in our student demographic uh, as a result of going from fully residential programs with a higher tuition fee, to be quite frank, um, with you know, lowering that fee and increasing the opportunity for 
you know, people who you know, have to maintain jobs and have family obligations or caring obligations to be able to participate in our programs or, you know, students who are um, elsewhere in the world to be able to fully participate in a program like Movement Mind Ecology without being present. Um, absolutely, there continue to be barriers, barriers to technological access, barriers to, um, you know, I would push back a little bit on, on sort of access to natural spaces, because I think one, one thing that we did explore in the, in the program was, you know, and throughout the conversations was what is a natural space um, and how do we sort of define the more than human world in ways that can be much more inclusive. Um, and we don't all have to be sort of John Muir or Henry David Thoreau or, or you know, someone to go out into a wilderness um, when we're surrounded by the more than human world, you know, wherever we might be. Um, and sometimes it, it does mean sort of critically looking at what that engagement means and, and thinking about our own sort of prejudices and assumptions. And I think that's a really healthy conversation and, and engagement to do on, uh, uh, in a course like this. So I think that's the start at it and not an answer, but a start at more of a conversation there. And that's really helpful. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining this session. It's been a real pleasure to have a brief conversation and you know, certainly our, our um, details, I think, are accessible on the conference website so people can access us uh, via email. And I hope to hear from many of you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for Thank Bell, you so Rachel, Marie, for a beautiful session. Thank you so Thank much. You for the session as well.